The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Hello. Hey, Jack DeGraw. How you doing, Ralph? Uh, doing quite well. We're going to have a little bit of a New York Yankee podcast, and I thought you'd be the first one I call to uh, fill us in on the recent Yankee trades. So if you would, Jack. Well, Ralph, I'm happy. Of course, you know, we're getting uh, Zach Britton. That was a, that was a big acquisition because, you know, that's another big arm in the in the bullpen, and you never have an, enough of them. And like, uh, you know, J.A. Happ, that I think he, you just, he's a guy you want to get like five or six innings out of. He's not a great pitcher, but he's a good pitcher, and I think it's a, a good acquisition. Well, J.A. Happ reminds me of Vargas, and um, they, the Mets expected what you just said, five good six innings out of a fifth starter. And you'd be in great shape. And I hope he serves the Yankees better than Vargas served the Mets. I don't know what happened with him. It's like a lost year for the Mets. And he was integral in that uh, right from the start. So um, Hap could be the answer. It's almost like the rich get rich and um, the poor get poorer. May I ask you, were you disappointed in not getting Machado? No, uh, because I, I don't think the problem is offense. You know, uh, you know the, the Dodgers gave up five uh, prospects for him, and he's just a virtue, you know, a rental. And I mean, if the Yankees want him, they can still get him as a free agent and stuff. Because I don't even know if the Dodgers are going to sign him. But you know, the Yankees. A problem, and most of baseball is, you know, you have to have pitching. That's what's going to win for you in the playoffs. I mean, how much better would Machado made the Yankees? Uh, I don't know because it's hard to say. It's hard to quantify how much the effect of the Dodgers signing Machado will help them sign him for next year. And that's – you're not just playing for this year. You're playing for down the road. And as good as the Yankees are offensively, as good as both um, Torres and D.D. have been in, in on the left side of the infield, which at any time could become the right side of the infield if uh, you want to do a little shifting. But my, my point is – as good as those guys are, Machado is a considerably upgraded ball player. I know that didn't come out right. Uh, my grandma was horrible, but um, he's a hell of a hitter. And uh, third base, shortstop, gives you the, ver the versatility there. He's a gold glove third baseman, uh, thinks he can be a shortstop. Uh, he's kind of in the middle of the pack defensively for shortstop. But what a bat, and he's only 26 years old. So I can't answer the question for this year, but I certainly can um, down the road. He'll, he'll help anybody he signs with. That would be a good sign. And I think the Dodgers will get a leg up in negotiating with him, uh, provided it works out and he gets along, and uh, especially if the Dodgers win. Um, the Yankees could end up losing out. So it's a hard one to make a, make a call on, and uh, like with everything else, we lose track, deals and trades and signings. You can't really judge them for two, three, four, sometimes five years down the road, how it all works out. Um, that, those are my thoughts. Anything to add to that? Well, there's no doubt, Ralph. I mean, Machado makes anybody better, and he's a you know he's a great hitter. 
The only thing, I mean, the Yankees are definitely have interest in him, but, you know, you put Machado at shortstop, and then, you know, you lose defensively because Didi is an outstanding fielder. Didi can make all the plays. No question about that. No question about that. But um, let's assume you put him at third. Not that Torres is not young and good, but look at those numbers that Machado has put up. Um, and, again, Torres is uh, – is a rookie, so we don't know how he's going to respond to the sophomore jinx, to uh, to all of it. Um, and, and I'm not, uh, I wouldn't give up on that side of the infield. I'd just take it into, necessarily, I'd just take all that into consideration and I would have, um, and I'm sure Cashman did take take that into consideration um, when he uh, pretty much passed, I would say, because the Yankees were as loaded, as, probably still are as loaded as anybody in the farm system. Triple A, you got you have guys in Triple A that can start on most teams in the majors, so. Um, you're sitting pretty. Yeah. Well, now we're, we're talking Andrew Hartz at, at third, like, like now, and I know the Yankees, there was some talk. They're not too happy with him defensively, even though I think he's done pretty well. And, uh, you know, with the two trades with the Orioles in Toronto, I mean, the guys the Yankees lost, all those guys will be in the big leagues. And who knows, Toronto getting Drury, that might be the the, the best part of the whole trade. Mm-hmm. For them. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And they're not going anywhere this year either. So um, do you think the Yankees have depleted the the best prospects um, in their organization? No. No, they, they, they still kept – the top guys. I mean, Dylan Tate, there's another guy. You, you, you'll probably see him in September with the Orioles and Josh Rogers and Carroll. And th- these guys will pitch in the big leagues. But uh, the Yankees have so much talent in the minors. I mean, there's kids down here in Tampa you haven't even heard about. There's like three or four kids down here. They got a, they got a guy they just promoted to double A. He had 20 home runs in the Florida State League. You know, uh, Wagner. Oh. And that's something down here you never see because it, this is a it's a pitchers league down here, and there's a couple pitchers down here Nelson, and I forget the other kid's name, but uh, so there's there's some talent you know uh, there's talent all over. Anything in the futures game that uh, stood out to you? No, not really, Ralph. I mean, I'm glad Sheffield uh, you know got a chance to pitch, but. Uh, you know, n- nothing really uh, that, that I can remember offhand. Is Sheffield a, a Gary Sheffield uh, offspring? Uh, no, that that was that was talked about when the trade first happened. But no, he's he's no relation to Gary. Okay, just curious about that. Um, what on the big league impresses you, and what about uh, over the past few weeks? Uh, what has impressed you? And tell me about Boston and how they match up with the Yankees. You've always been totally objective. Even though you love the Yankees, you're able to uh, talk about their strengths and their weaknesses. And, um, you know, you don't kowtow. So uh, I want you to first tell me what's impressed you about the Yankees of late and uh, then tell me about how they stand up against Boston. Well, the, the, the thing is, Ralph, over the last, I think, 25, 26 games, they, they've just been a 500 team. And the thing that concerns me about the Yankees, it's like most of baseball now. They're, they're basically, you know, a power team. It's all or nothing at all. And the one, you know, the one thing I think we should mention is like, uh, you know, Gary Sanchez. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the play Monday night, it wasn't that he didn't run out the ground ball at the end because maybe, you know, maybe he's injured. But the play that concerns me is, you know, the pass ball he walked after and the guy scored from second. You know, his head was up his ass on that one. But, you know, it's not like he didn't run out the, the ball 
go in the first. He didn't initially, but he put a burst of speed on that leads me to believe that he his groin injury, uh, that's not the reason. Uh, they didn't want to put him in AAA, and they can't really overlook that day. So I think what they're doing is just uh, taking an easy way out. I don't know how... Major League Baseball checks on these things, but it wouldn't surprise me if he wasn't hurt all that much. Yeah, you know, Ralph, like when he walked after that wild pitch and the kid scored from second, it's like, you know, that become, that makes the whole organization look bad because that looks like, you know, a desire issue, you know, that. Does he want to get better defensively? And, I mean, is he just going to be satisfied, you know, with being a big slugger and knocking in runs? Because you need a good offensive catcher. And, I mean, if he if, if he's going to walk after the ball and stuff, it just, you know, it, it brings up questions about his, uh, you know, desire and his, his discipline to want to get better. He's young, though. He, he, oh, yeah. He's not someone who can be given up on uh, People oh, no. talk, talking about, well, dump his ass here, to get rid of him there. You really can't. You get, um, it's like, um, when do you come in, when does a player come into his own? And I think it takes players longer and longer to come into their own because they're already millionaires. They're not fighting for the big bucks. They've made the big bucks, whether they've signed the the ultimate contract or not, they're getting paid an ungodly amount just as minimum salaries, and that tends to spoil a player. You see the difference in attitude in the minor league players um, down where you are in Tampa that, um, and how they change when they, they get to the bigs. Not, oh, yeah. Um availability to the public, to the press, um, it just minor league ball is where it's at, to be honest with you. It, it, oh, yeah. Um, speak to the fun that you have following these kids along the way and watching them develop. Isn't that great? Oh, oh, it's incredible. I mean, when I first came down here, and I and I still go to the games, but – for the first 10 years, you know, a lot of the pitchers used to, you know, to sit in the stands and stuff. And you know, they'd be sitting right in front of you, you know, and you get to talking baseball and you get to talking about a lot of things. And it, and it was, it was, it was just a lot of fun because, you know, the, the baseball people are just great, uh, great people. And I mean, they were all great kids. The Yankees are a class organization and, uh, you know, but a couple of them, they did change when they got to the big leagues, and, and that was sorry to see. And the big one was being uh, Montera, Asus Montera. I mean, his, his attitude changed from, you know, like a, a complete turnaround. And that's why he never really made it. Yeah. That, uh, what did Yogi Berra say? 80% of it is mental, and the rest of it, the, and 50% of it is physical. I, I think he, he um, made that math very famous in his day. Miss Yogi. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I, I don't think people realize, uh, Ralph, how talented these kids are, even in the minor leagues. I mean, they can all throw hard, they can all hit, and it's just the thing of putting it together. Right. Uh, would you get to the Red Sox and uh, tell me objectively how they match up, if you can? Well, right now, I, I I think the Yankees, the Yankees, I believe they got a chance to overtake them. I mean, getting the Valdi, I don't know if that's going to be too big of a move. The thing that, if I was a Red Sox fan, would, would concern me about the pitching. And one of the, you know, like David Price just seems to not want to throw his curveball anymore. Uh, so, I mean, they got it. They got a heck of a team. They could go all the way, but. Uh, you know, I, I believe the Yankees can catch him. And, of course, the Yankees can lose in the wild card games, too. So it, it's really hard to say, Ralph. Okay. If you were a betting man, what would you say? If I was a betting man, okay. I think 
I don't know. It's going to come down to the last weekend, and of course, I'm biased. The Yankees and the Red Sox. I think the Yankees will overtake them on the last weekend. Okay. Up in the club. Um, coming up this week, anything stand out in your mind? And uh, what are the key? What are the keys this week for the Yankees to be successful? Well, I'd like to like to see Sonny Gray how he does tonight, you know, against Kansas City, and uh, you know, I'm anxious to see how uh, you know half pitches and how they use Britain coming out of the bullpen. Right, you got to be happy with Tanaka. Yeah, Whoa. yeah. I mean, he threw he threw a complete game, and, and you don't see that anymore. Uh, that's exactly what I was talking about. You very how many? Complete games. I think there were like twelve complete games all year. Um, maybe I misread that, but it was an ungodly low amount of complete games. Um, and do you think your embarrassment of riches in the bullpen can make up for any shaky problems that the Yankees may have with their starting pitches? I mean. You go down, if you have to bring guys in in the fifth inning at this point, you put, you're you okay, which uh, – Yeah. Is I, I think that's what's going to ha- happen, Ralph. I mean, I mean you're going to see guys throw five innings, and, and you know, they'll, they'll start bringing in the bullpen. And another thing that's coming up, I mean, the rosters expand September 1st. Mm-hmm. So you'll, you'll be seeing uh, four or five more pitchers come up. Right, and uh, which pitcher that will be coming up do you think will make an impact? Well, I I think, Ralph, you might see Chance Adam come up from AAA, and they might stick him in the bullpen, and they might do the same thing with Sheffield because, you know, you get a lefty, in, in Yankee Stadium in the playoffs, you know, he, he could make a he could make a difference. Okay. I've been asking podcasters about their favorite Yankee team. Not Yankees, but their favorite team. I know the Yankees are your favorite team, but what year Yankee team was your favorite growing up? Okay. Well, now I... Now, I, I'm a Yankee fan. I don't – I remember 61. I don't remember it specifically. But I, I'd have to say the 98 team, 1998 team, because it's like whatever they had to do to win, they did it. If they needed a homer in the ninth inning, they come up with it. If they needed somebody to make a big play, they come up with it. It, it was absolutely amazing what that 1998 team did. Okay. That was a Tory managed team, of course. Yeah. With Zimmer sitting on the bench. Now, what – can you speak – and it's so hard to be um, – uh, to give a an answer that's um, – that to quantify coaching and managing. Let's put it that way, the effects of coaching and managing. But how much of an effect did Don Zimmer have as a bench coach for, for the Yankees? Well, he he made a big difference because just with all the experience he had in baseball and stuff, and, you know, him and Torrey had a great relationship. And I think the great thing about Joe Torrey is Joe Torrey didn't have a big ego. And he knew how to, like, handle the players. And the big thing is he he knew how to handle George. Right, right. Uh, And that was no no small trick. Everybody who looks back at the – at uh, George Steinbrenner now, and, uh, well, if George were alive, it would be a better Yankee team. He had some tumultuous years. Well, you know, the, the good thing, another, another Ralph, uh, there's a Don Zimmer story. Zimmer had balls. I remember the Yankees were 6-8, and eight, and they had a meeting early in the season, and Zimmer and, you know, Torrey was there and all the Yankee coaches, and Steinbrenner said, anybody in this room – who thinks they've done everything they can to help this team win can get up and leave. And Zimmer got up and left. <laughs> <laughs> he left the, yeah. left the meeting. He left the meeting, and all the coaches they they couldn't they, you know they had to stop they had to hold laughter. But right. that's the way Zim was. 
I'll tell you another interesting uh, piece of minutia about Don Zimmer. As far as I know, he never worked a day's, never put in a day's work that wasn't baseball. Notwithstanding being in the service, but um, for his avocation on his tombstone, baseball, nothing else. And um, he was the epitome of an, uh, a baseball man with experience as a player, as a coach, as a manager, as a um, bench coach, this, that, and the other thing. Um, and a lot of people forget he was destined to be the next Pee Wee Reese with the Dodgers coming up as a shortstop. And he was very seriously he's beamed or ended up with a plate in his skull or something of the like and ran into a wall or something and was never the, never the same yet um, managed to um, have a like 15-year major league career, was the um, the original New York Met third baseman. And, and didn't he go like 0 for 34? Yes, he did. He was horrible. <laughs> and guess who they traded him for? Who? Marv Throneberry. Marvelous Marv. Marvelous Marv, who gave them absolutely... Um, horrible uh, play, uh, offensively and defensively, especially defensively. He was like um, a stiff who really surprised in how bad he, he could be, and ironically, he was a, one of the leading um, Yankee prospects coming up. He was a, a, um, a no-miss guy, and at a time when they were real, really um, putting money into the farm system as well. It wasn't like after um, CBS bought them when nothing was going back into the farm system. Actually, Del Webb, in the last few years, they owned the Yankees, stopped putting money into the farm system. So when they sold the team, um, it coincided with them going downhill because – Nothing was coming out um, short of Jake Gibbs and Horace Clark. Well, well, Ralph, uh, if, if, you know, you check the, the stats. Marv Thornberry in two years with the Yankees and the minors had like over 80 home runs and stuff. So he was a he was a big stud down there. And uh, then he got to the big leagues and, you know, uh, he made Miller commercials. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did. And I have the proud um, – nothing to be really proud of, but I have the memory of going to a doubleheader at, uh, at the Polo Grounds in 1962. And in one of the games, Lou Brock, who was like 145 pounds and an outfielder with the Cubs, hits a ball into the center field bleachers in, in the Polo Grounds. Nobody does that. Joe Adcock did it. I think Mays might have done it once or twice. But very few p players have ever hit a ball that far. And Lou Brock muscles up. In the, the other game, Throneberry hits what was an apparent triple. And Cookie Lavagetto is at first base. And the umpire called him out, called Throneberry out, for either missing first base or second base down the line, g going into third. And Stengel comes out to argue, and Lavagetto says, don't bother arguing. He missed both bases. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> and and, you, and I, you, you remember what Casey said? Uh, Casey can said, anybody play this game? <laughs> no, Casey said, well, I know he didn't miss third because he's standing on it. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Oh, that's great. I, I didn't. I didn't know that. I, that's a great line. Uh, Casey was unbelievable with those early Mets, and um, I'll never forget his retirement 
slash firing for the from the Yankees. And he said they fired him ostensibly because he was 70 years old and he was, quote, losing it. Now, whether he was or not is open for a lot of debate, and we can go into the 60 World Series and some of the moves he made. But this, that, and the other thing, he he uh, loses his job, and he stands up in front of the press, and he says, well, they tell me they fired me. My services are no longer desired because I reached the age of 70. Well, I'll never make that mistake of doing that again. <laughs> and then they, he got the job with the Mets and he, he didn't even know their name he called them the Knickerbockers he, <laughs> to the press he says well I just accepted a job with the New York Knickerbockers <laughs> quite an interesting well, guy yeah well Casey made the early Mets uh that's uh, interesting. interesting. I just remember the first and bearable to a, a. I'm a 16 year old kid who's lost his New York Giant team like four or five years ago. So happy to have a National League team, and hated the fact that the Mets lost over and over again early on in '62, '63. Casey made made it cute to the fans. He made it. Um, uh, to, he handled the press like uh, uh, like a genius. He'd stay up drinking with them and give them stories and keep them entertained and off the, off the subject of the Mets being horrible on the field. Not as horrible as they've been in the last couple of months <laughs> this year, but um, horrible nonetheless. <laughs> it, um, and those thrown very years were... I mean, th- you can call them the Throneberry years, and not be not be far off uh, from that standpoint. I think I misspoke. I, I think Don Zimmer was traded for Cliff Cook, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And yeah. it was Hobie Landreth that was traded for for um, Throneberry. So. And and how about Harry Cheetah getting traded for Harry Cheetah? Right. Right, Harry <laughs> Chidi traded from the Cubs for a player to be named later. They come back and named Harry Chidi as that said player, and <laughs> he goes back to the Cubs. Now, I think that was the first time that uh, that ever happened. Um, in a sense, it's happened since with the Rule Five draft. Um, you, you can say that's um, almost like being traded for yourself. If, they don't um, keep you all year. They have to send you back to your original club. But um, in those days, that was one of the the great fables of um, those Mets' early years. They were horrible in ways that you can't put into a simulation baseball game. <laughs> um, and I play a lot of those things uh, where you – pick teams from the old days and they statistically uh, perform like they perform like they do statistically you can't be that bad statistically it, statistics didn't show it they weren't that bad statistically as a matter of fact uh, Frank Thomas hit 34 home runs that year um, yeah and uh, they had some other Richie Ashburn made the the all-star team, uh, they had to have someone from each team. And uh, he had a decent year. He hit 302, as a matter of fact. But he was most famous for getting the most out of Marv Throneberry, who was kind of a dull guy. But um, Richie Ashburn stood behind him and propped him up and made it seem fun in the clubhouse when um, when he was doing so. I remember that Casey Stengel said on Marv's birthday, we were going to get you a cake, but we were afraid you'd drop it. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, 
the Mets and the Yankees, the history of the Mets and the Yankees are closely intertwined. Yeah. Because the other player were, that exemplified.